He was fun. I mean, the lessons he taught you were not the same way anybody else taught you. I mean, you'd have somebody come in and destroy that cat, destroy the whole house. You remember that? That's what children do. And they get caught. They, they, somebody comes in and catches them. He, he had that vision. That is good, said the fish. He has gone away, yes. But your mother will come. She will find this big mess. And this mess is so big and so deep and so tall. We cannot pick it up. There's no way at all. And then, who was back in the house? Why, the cat. Have no fear of this mess, said the cat in the hat. I always pick up all my playthings, and so I will show you another good trick that I know. And he put them away. Then he said, that is that. And then he was gone with a tip of his hat. Then our mother came in, and she said to us too, did you have any fun? Tell me, what did you do? Should we tell her about it? Now, what should we do? Well, what would you do if your mother asked you? The possibility of somebody finding out that would have been way too powerful for me. I wouldn't have been able to sleep at night. I would have been one of those kids who woke up in the middle of the night. Mommy, I gotta tell you something. A cat came. He was in the house and he cleaned it up. I'm so sorry. You know, I mean, I just couldn't have held that in. <laughs> Released in the spring of 1957, The Cat in the Hat quickly became a national phenomenon. Newsweek declared Ted the Moppets Milton. Within three years, it sold nearly one million copies at $1.95 each. The message of the cat and the world's acceptance, love, embracing of the cat were so powerful that uh, the old ideas about Ted being an old-fashioned cartoonist who had no place in kids' books, I think, dissolved very quickly. And, in front of that onslaught. The book is currently available in 26 languages and in 2003 became a big budget feature film. Cut. There are differences, but they're all sort of born, they're all born out of the world that was created by Theodore Geisel and the characters that were created by Theodore Geisel. And we've made them extreme. This cat should not be here. He should not be about. He should not be here when your mother is out. He once said, when I'm gone, things will be different because the creator will be gone and there are different ways to look at this. That on some level, things may be happening now that he kind of sniffs his nose at. We had read Dr. Seuss to the children. There was a nice, lovely rhythm about what he wrote. But when Random House published The Cat in the Hat, I flipped. Bennett Cerf's wife Phyllis joined Ted and Helen Geisel to form a company that would publish books intended for very young children to read by themselves. Random House would be their distributor. Basically what my mom and Ted and Helen did when the beginner book started was to take the Dick and Jane formula, to take the exact vocabulary that those books used and the same way of, of introducing a few words at a time and only putting a few words on a page and just say, this is going to be crazy, instead of, it's just going to be, look at this and see that. But these books sold in a way that nothing Ted had written before sold. Twenty years after his first book for children, Theodore Geisel became Random House's best-selling author. His book royalties were a mere $5,000 the year before he took the Cat in the Hat Challenge. In 1959, they totaled $200,000. Dr. Seuss was hailed as the savior of children's literacy. We herald Harry Potter as this, something that made kids want to read. And, you know, that's why it's so successful. This man really invented reading for many kids. And that was really the beginning of Dr. Seuss's real fame. Before that, he was uh, the icing on the cake. He wasn't the cake. You know, they had a rhythm. They had style. They had humor. What was there to dislike about them? They, they were, in a sense, what the funny papers strived to do. And Ted Geisel was the Renoir of funny papers, is all I can tell you. The 
The cat in the hat phenomenon forced a private man into the public eye. Ted Geisel, who hated crowds, cameras, and interviews, had one more challenge to face. Children. He had had almost no experience with them. So he didn't know how to act around them. He was a naturally shy person, even around adults. But with children, that shyness was magnified tremendously. At the beginning, he was sometimes quite stiff. As he made appearances, he got better and better and realized that talking to them as, as he signed was something they liked. And, and Ted was a person who really cared about pleasing other people. For a man who linked so beautifully in writing, he seemed, he said, to be genuinely afraid he'd disappoint them. It's part of the insecurity thing. He thought if they looked up and didn't see a clown or Santa Claus, they'd think he was a phony, and that he couldn't bear. There are famous stories of kids coming up and knocking on his door and asking to see Dr. Seuss and him saying, I'm Dr. Seuss, and them going, no, you're not. <laughs> He never made it sound like he was bitterly disappointed that they were disappointed. He just thought it was funny. Geisel's publisher would receive as many as 1,000 letters a week addressed to Dr. Seuss, ranging from requests for money to birthday greetings. Dear Dr. Seuss, I used to have a cat, but he got run over. Happy birthday. Love, Sarah. Ted called his few weekly responses cat notes and often composed them in Seussian verse. Some of the boys and girls want to know if you give people injections and do you give them things to make them better. Does anybody want any special injections? No. No, I, I don't think we do. We will give no injections today at all. I don't believe that he held kids to live in some mysterious place, certainly, that he couldn't plumb. I think he had a wonderful natural affinity for it. This tidying up machine, how does it work? Well, sometimes it doesn't work at all. Oh, this is a steam contraption. There's, there's a dipolator in here that runs the whole thing, which ties on with the cantabulus, which is down near the end here. The cantabulus and the dipolator dip sometimes don't froing. Which gets us into a terrible situation. Yes. And but do they have a froinging thing to make the it froing better? Yes. You yes. send it to the defroingers if yes. it gets too much yes. froing. Yes, I see. He didn't particularly like children. I mean, he didn't dislike them, but he said, you know, some kids are great and some kids are creeps, and, you know, I like the great ones and I don't like the creeps, and that was it. But, you know, he really wasn't immersed in some love of, of the children's life. And one last question, Dr. Zeus. Do you like writing stories for children? Oh, I'd rather do that than anything I know. Well, I'll tell you a secret, everybody. Most grown-ups like reading them, too. I write for myself, Ted once said. Children are just as smart as you are. The main difference is they don't know so many words. If your story is simple, you can tell it just as if you're telling it to adults. After his success using a 225-word vocabulary with the cat in the hat, Bennett Cerf bet Ted that he could not write a beginner book using only 50 words. Challenged once again, Ted retreated into his studio and worked for a solid year, writing, counting words, and rewriting over and over again. What he produced would become the best-selling Dr. Seuss book of all time. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam, I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. He proved something in it that no one else could possibly do, that, that no matter what strictures he put on, he'll still write something absolutely incredible. The book itself is incredibly simple, but Ted got every possibility out of those few words that you could possibly get. Plus, the book itself is, again, about something mischievous that kids absolutely love. And Ted was a big kid himself.